everyone. Uh, so I talked about how we can make confidence intervals by hand, and now we're going to talk about how to do it uh, not by hand. So uh, basically taking advantage of all of these nice functions that have been provided to you via R in the stats package, which is automatically loaded whenever R loads up. It comes with every R installation because at the end of the day, R is a programming language that was made for statistics. So it comes with a lot of statistics functions and they're generally pretty good. So we're going to use a lot of those functions. So when a function comes from the stats package, uh, a lot of these functions like a t t-test and so on, uh, have a few parameters to be aware of. One is conf.level and the other is alternative. Conf.level uh, specifies the desired confidence level. So conf.level equals 0.99 says that we want a 99% confidence interval and alternative to decides what type of interval we're get getting. So we could possibly be getting an upper bound, uh, a lower bound or a two sided interval. And by default, alternative is two sided to create two sided intervals. Uh, but uh, we could set alternative equals greater to compute a one sided 100 C percent. That's a typo. 100 C percent confidence lower bound. So this is a number such that you believe that the true parameter value is above this number. And you could say alternative equals less to get a one-sided 100 C percent confidence upper bound. This parameter alternative, by the way, is getting its name from the behavior of the alter from or its name and its behavior because of alternative hypotheses and hypothesis testing, which is what's going to be the subject of the next lecture. So I'm not going to go into why it's that way or why these are the words that you use for lower bound and upper bound. Uh, but basically it's because of hypothesis testing. These uh, bounds are also corresponding to hypothesis tests. Okay, so let's uh, move on and discuss a number of these functions. Although maybe I should, before I go on, probably should say just one thing. That's a convention in the stats package, which comes with base R. I try when I, to, when I write functions to, uh, I try to keep in alignment with the stats package and try to keep that interface. I think it's inter its interface is pretty reasonable. Uh, but there is no guarantee if you were to get some package from the wild that the package author will uh, obey that those conventions. That other package's author will see the conventions as a suggestion and then decide whether they agree with that suggestion or not. So... Uh, this is the case for the stats package, but for other packages, you probably should not uh, be expecting too much. Okay, uh, it, you should just read their documentation and see what they want you to do. Okay, uh, enough about that. Uh, let's suppose that we want an inter interval for the co uh, for, po for the population mean. And this time, we're not going to assume that we know what sigma is. And we're actually going to keep the assumption... And we're going to impose and respect the assumption that the data came from a normal distribution. If this is the case, then uh, we have the random variable t, which is x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n, where s is the sample standard deviation. Uh, xi is drawn from some normal distribution. t is going to follow what's known as student's t distribution. With degrees of free param degrees of freedom parameter nu, which is equal to n minus one, uh, we can denote this with t following a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So the confidence interval is constructed using critical values from the t distribution. This is the resulting confidence interval, uh, which is pretty similar to what we had in the case of uh, known sigma, except we replace sigma with s and z with t, uh, t alpha over two n minus one. Uh, where alpha is equal to 1 minus the confidence level. And uh, and otherwise, this is still an upper tail. Uh, this is a critical value based on top upper tail areas. Uh, N minus 1 is the degrees of freedom. I write plus or minus T uh, to mean, well, you're adding and subtracting, so this translates into an interval. So this will be the margin of error of the interval. Okay, uh, if we are going to uh, use the T distribution we should probably check that the data actually came from a normal distribution. So using what I have from uh, earlier, uh, we're still looking at the Versicolor data set, but this time we're not going to assume we know what sigma is. So let's create a QQ plot. Uh, let's promote this, uh, where we uh, 
check to see that the versicolor sepal lengths appear to be normally distributed. And based off of this QQ plot, like it, it really doesn't get any better than this. This is one of the best QQ plots I can see. Uh, this, like, yeah, it, it, only fictitious data sets almost have uh, QQ plots this good. So it seems like not only does the, the normal distribution seems very appropriate to describe uh, the distribution of sepal lengths. So the normality assumption seems reasonable. Now, I should probably mention that if the normality assumption doesn't hold, T distributions and uh, the T the T confidence intervals often are still working pretty well, uh, especially for large sample sizes. If you have a large sample size, then it will work just fine. Uh, if your data is a, is reasonably symmetric without harsh outliers, the T confidence interval seems to generally work pretty well. Um, how do we know that? Well, it's basically just simulations. Uh, simulations would suggest that T confidence intervals would work well. Anyway, the function responsible for constructing a confidence interval is t-test. Now, when I type this uh, into R, what you're getting is a lot more than confidence interval. You're actually getting the results of a hypothesis test. So actually, you're getting a lot more information than what you actually, or what we're concerned with right now. We get an entire hypothesis test. But amongst the results that we get, we also get a 95% confidence interval by default. Um, we can uh, change how that confidence interval is working by changing the conf level uh, and the alternative. So this is going to be um, an upper bound and uh, a 99% confidence upper bound. So the confidence interval is going to be from negative infinity up to 6.1155, whatever. Uh, so uh, we can, if we want to, extract just the confidence interval from the results of t-test because what's actually happening here is <coughs> excuse me t-test is constructing an object that r's printing like it, it, you you would think oh it's actually just printing out results nothing's actually being created nothing's actually being saved and that's not true we can save the results of t-test well as i've done here where i did t-test for a few cases where i said confidence level is 0.9 if i were to type in tt1 it prints out the results, but also we can examine the structure of the object that was created by that function call. And it's actually a list. It's a list that contains a few uh, bits of information like the test statistic, uh, parameter estimates, or, or parameter values, p-values, confidence, uh, confidence interval. This is actually what we're interested in, but also like the estimate uh, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, which admittedly is of more greater interest to us when we're... Um, uh, talking about hypothesis testing, but we did want the confidence interval and this list, it is a list, right? I could do as.list tt1, it, it prints out, oh, okay. Uh, um, well, I mean, it was already a list, I guess. So when I say as.list, it, it, it keeps this attribute called class. Um, it has a class attribute, uh, which is called htest, and it's the reason why it doesn't print out like um, a, a a list would. But if we were to say class uh, tt1 uh, were null and then print tt1, it prints out like a list as you've seen before. All right, so we'll now set, we'll set the class attribute uh, back to what uh, it was before. If you're interested in uh, what and how this is working, check out my lectures on R object-oriented programming. Uh, that I wrote for Math 3080. So, but then we go this. All right. All right. Uh, but in the end, what we have is a list, which means we can access the elements of that list. Uh, for instance, uh, if I want the confidence interval for the first case, I could do tt1.conf.int. And it gives me the confidence interval. Uh, this, is act this is a vector, and that vector actually has an attribute uh, corresponding to the confidence level, which we could obtain via HTR. Uh, so attr tt1 dollar conf dot int, uh, and we want the confidence level. That gets the confidence level for us. But basically, this is the vector. So, and it's a vector. We can treat it like a vector. For instance, uh, if we wanted the lower bound, uh, all right. If we want the lower bound, we could access the lower bound like so. If we want the upper bound, we could access it like like so. So, uh, 
It's a vector. All right. Uh, kind of like the vector that we created in the last video. And uh, we can access the elements of that vector. All right. I want to create a graphic comparing the confidence intervals that I just created. Uh, because TT1 uh, was a confidence interval where the confidence level was 90%. Uh, for TT2, the confidence level was 95%. For TT3, the confidence level was 99%. And uh, let's uh, create... All right, so this is actually getting rather tricky. Um, uh, but what I'm going to do is create a list uh, that uh, contains the confidence intervals. Uh, so this is what the resulting uh, list looks like. So it's just, it's a list. Uh, then I'm going to load in the reshape library, uh, melt the data set. Here's the melted data set as a data frame, uh, recast it uh, so that I have columns uh, uh, corresponding to type lower and upper bound. And this is the resulting uh, data frame. So now I can plot it with ggplot2 uh, like so. And now we can look at these confidence intervals. And uh, so, um, and, and by the way, if you're watching these videos in the regular semester, I do believe that I will have, uh, I would have, that students would have already watched some videos about uh, this reshape package and how exactly this code is working and what it's doing. Um, but long story short, it's meant to reshape, <laughs> reshape, uh, put objects into different, uh, formats. Uh, anyway, uh, the resulting plot is a comparison of these intervals. Uh, through the middle of the plot, you can imagine the parameter estimate, and these intervals are centered on that parameter estimate. And we can see that for the 90% confidence interval, it's a narrower interval, whereas for the 99% confidence interval, it's a wider interval. Okay? All right. So uh, that was the case for the population mean for normally distributed data. Uh, now let's look at the population proportion. So for the population proportion, we have Bernoulli data, and it's going, and you get a success with probability p. Um, the number of successes is a binomial random variable, and the natural estimator for the population proportion is the sample proportion. Uh, so uh, we can construct uh, confidence intervals uh, for p like. So this is basically a result that's using the central limit there, and we can use this confidence interval uh, to come up with the confidence interval for p hat. Uh, the issue, though, well, okay, this is the interval that's constructed via prop test. Uh, prop test takes two inputs, x and n, where x is the number of successes and n is the sample size. So, but so the example in this uh, uh, in this in these lecture notes are actually from 2016 i'm recording this video in 2020 where once again uh donald trump is uh running for president and uh so uh, we have this uh june 2016 cnn orc poll where 420 participants out of 1001 said they were going to uh vote for donald trump and we would like to come up with a confidence interval for the proportion of individuals in the population who say they're going to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, we can just basically plug in how many successes there were uh, and also the size of the study to get uh, the confidence interval. But this function, again, is doing a hypothesis test, kind of like t-test. We would have to extract this part right here to get the confidence interval, but that's not a problem because if we wanted to, we could do uh, $conf.int and it would get us that confidence interval. So... All right. Um, okay, so there's the confidence interval. According to this, the 95% confidence interval is 0.388 to, or 38, 39% to 45% of the population supporting Donald Trump for president. Um, let's see. The point estimate was uh, 4, 0.42. So this is about plus or minus three percentage points, which is pretty conventional uh for for uh for uh surveys like this so um right uh, so the confidence this confidence interval that we just showed here it was actually really popular for a long time um and it's still showing up in textbooks but it's really flawed it's it's very flawed like because uh 
it's not exactly a confidence interval because it's not using exactly the correct distribution uh, for p hat. It, what it's relying on instead is the normal distribution and a normal approximation. And in addition to a normal pro approximation, uh, the standard error is estimated by plugging in p hat directly, um, which tends to result in problems. Uh, so uh, it actually cannot promise that it's capturing the true parameter value uh, C, uh, 100C percent of the time. And in fact, often doesn't, and not only does it not uh, often capture the true parameter value, whether it does or doesn't often depends on what the actual parameter value is, which is something that you don't know. So it has bad behavior, and as a result, it's not actually all that popular anymore, and it's actively discouraged. Uh for, from use uh, actively and we, we tell people not to use it so there are alternative functions and alternative procedures to use to uh, get confidence intervals for p so for example there is the binconf function from the hmisc pa package uh, that allows for other popular confidence intervals uh, such as inter such as an exact confidence interval uh, that is based off of the uh, binomial distribution. You've got the uh, Wilson confidence interval. Uh, you've got, uh, I think this is also known as a score confidence interval. We've got a number of different confidence interval methods that we could use. So um, let's uh, uh, let's go ahead and uh, use the binconf package to uh, compute confidence intervals. Or the binconf function, not the binconf package. It's in the hmisc package. All right. Uh, it works pretty similarly to prop test, but now we can give it different methods. For example, we can tell it to use the Wilson method to get a confidence interval, and it's actually coming up with something very nice. The point estimate, the lower bound, and the upper bound. Uh, we could uh, change. This time, we're not changing the confidence level. We're changing alpha, which is 1 minus the confidence level. So this was a 95% confidence interval. Uh, when we say alpha equals 0.01, we're going to get a 99% uh, confidence interval. So, all right, that's that's nice. And uh, there's another function called binom test that is using uh, the binomial distribution, which is the which uh, is the more correct distribution uh, rather than a, a, a normal approximations to uh, compute the interval. So here is binom test. This is actually coming from the stats package. Um, here's the interval that it comes up with, which is, I don't think it's all that different from what we had before. Uh, we could also try, um, a lower bound by saying alternative equals greater, and then set the confidence level to 99% by saying comp level equals 0.99. Okay. Uh, so that's that, uh, next up, uh, that was all the univariate stuff I wanted to talk about. Now I want to talk about, uh, paired sample inference. And chances are, if you're taking the Math 370 class at the University of Utah, uh, we have not talked about this yet, but we're going to talk about it now because this is the R lab, and the R lab uh, trivializes a lot of things, so it goes really fast. Uh, right, so now we are working with paired data. We have paired data, Xi, where we have Xi and a corresponding Yi. Examples of paired data include maybe weight before and after a weight loss program or political views of a husband and a wife where the observations are in some sense paired up. Uh, they're, they're, whenever you see Xi, there's a corresponding Yi and vice versa. Each of those two uh, variables have corresponding means, mu x and mu y, and we want to compare those means. How are we going to do that? Well, what we could do is, is compute di, which is equal to Xi minus Yi, and then look at the mean difference, because the expected value of di, which is mu d, is also going to be mu x minus mu y. So if we're interested in whether mu x is less than mu y, or mu x is greater than mu y, or whether mu x is equal to mu y, uh, we could just basically look at mu d and say, is mu d less than zero? Is it greater than zero? Is it not zero? Can we do those things? Uh, one way we could compute confidence intervals for mu d, which what we do is we uh, compute these differences and then treat the differences as our data set and now we're back to the univariate uh, situation. 
Uh, so what we could do is basically compute those differences directly in t-test. Or if you want, you can use t-test x, y paired equals true, in which case you tell the t-test function, hey, this data is paired. And it will say, okay, it's paired. I will treat it as if it's paired, and it will give you uh, some nice looking results. Um, all right, so I would say that the difference between these two is mostly cosmetic. Um, well, I don't know. It's possible that when you uh, use paired, I guess we can find out, but it might give you uh, the means of both groups, um, whereas if you just did x minus y, it doesn't know that the data is paired. So uh, it's going to only give you the mean difference and stuff. You might get some more information if you use it that this way, and I would probably recommend using t-test this way as opposed to this way. Um, not that this way is wrong, it's just this way will give you better results. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to examine the traffic data set from the mass uh, uh, package which shows the effects of Swedish speed limits on accidents after an experiment where specific days in 1961 and 1962 saw different speed limits applied um, in a paired study. Uh, the study is somewhat complicated, um, uh, there, but long story short, there is a matched pairs design going on. Um, you should probably look at the data set to see exactly, as in the documentation for the data set, how exactly the study was working, if you're more interested, but um, there's some complications in it, and the all of this code, I'm not going to bother uh, explaining too much, because uh, basically some days of 1961, a higher speed limit was enforced, and in some days in 1961, a lower speed limit was enforced, and then they do the opposite the next year, so you'd have this mi intermixing of high and low speed limits um, in, in the two years. Um, which uh, results in a somewhat more uh, involved uh, data set. And we have this variable y that's tracking how many accidents were there were on a given day. And for what it's worth, uh, this is a situation where the data is not going to be normally distributed because the data is integer valued. If anything, it's probably Poisson. Like if I had to, if you asked me what type of distribution the data was following, I'd probably guess Poisson. I also don't really know for a fact that it is Poisson. So in fact, maybe we should investigate. But uh, for now, let's uh, uh, go and do some code that is supposed to get the data set into a nice format for us. And I'm not going to really explain this all that much. It's just at the end, we're going to have two vectors. Accidents when the limit was applied and accidents when the limit was not applied. And um, we and these uh, vectors are paired. So this is going to so this observation should go with this observation. This observation should go with this observation, and so on. Okay. Um, now that said, even though I did say that the data is not normally distributed, a QQ plot does uh, support basically us using a normal distribution, uh, which is kind of a funny thing. It's probably because the data is, it, it leads me to think that the data probably is Poisson. Um, because the Poisson distribution starts to resemble a normal distribution as you increase your mean parameter. So... Um, that makes me suspect that you could, that is the points on distribution, but one way or the other, uh, the number of observations is 59, in which case the T test is going to work pretty well. All right. So, um, here I did the T test where we have the accents with the limits strictly applied and not no limit strictly applied. And I did tell it that parity equals true. So it gives us the mean of the differences and it gives us a 95% confidence interval for the mean difference. And based off this interval, it appears that zero is not in the interval. Since zero is not in the interval, that suggests that there is probably a difference depending on whether the, the uh, speed limit is more or less strictly enforced. And in this case, since we were doing uh, limit minus no limit, uh, it suggests that there were more accidents when there was... Um, um, when, when, when limits, when speed limits were laxly enforced, then was the case when limits were strictly enforced. So it seems to suggest that, uh, enforcing speed limits well, um, leads to fewer accidents. All right. Uh, next.
Uh, next topic, testing for difference in population means between two independent samples. So this time we don't have any sort of pairing going on. Uh, so we have uh, a data set X1 to XN and uh, another data set Y1 to YM because the sample sizes could differ between these two data sets. And the means of the two populations, mu X and mu Y, are likely different. We want to attain a confidence interval for the difference in the means, mu X minus mu Y. The natural estimator for the difference in means is X bar minus Y bar, so the point estimate will be X bar minus Y bar. Now, that, so that all seems fine up until the point when we need to estimate a margin of error, uh, because then we need to estimate a standard error for the statistic X bar minus Y bar. And if we're going to estimate a standard error, we first need to ask ourselves, uh, does the data set share a common variance? If the, data set, if the two data sets have a common variance, then the data sets are said to be homoscedastic. Um, and uh, if they don't have a common variance, the data sets are said to be uh, heteroscedastic. Uh, homoscedasticity is a strong assumption. And it's nice uh, mathematically to work with homoscedasticity, but the problem is that homoscedasticity, it's so strong, it has a very strong impact on the resulting interval. And if it's wrong, then the interval is very wrong. And you've got garbage as your result. So most statisticians would say, just always assume that your data is heteroscedastic. Uh, heteroscedastic. Um, here is the uh, confidence interval if the data were in fact treated as being homoscedastic. Uh, if it's heteroscedastic, then you have to be you have to work harder, long story short. Um, you have to use um, different degrees of freedom because the data is not act the 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 uh, cr the statistic that's being used for creating the confidence interval is not actually following a normal distribution. So you have to no, not actually following a t distribution. It's following a distribution that looks like the t distribution, except this is the degrees of freedom, uh, or this is an estimate of the degrees of freedom. It's kind of a mess. Uh, it's honestly a mess, but R takes care of that mess for you. So you don't have to worry about it and you can just trust R to do the right thing. Uh, in which case your margin of error will be kind of what you would almost expect. Um, if you were, yeah, it's, it, this is almost what the theory would suggest you should use. Uh, you can decide whether the data should be, uh, treated as a uh, homoscedastic or not with the var equal parameter. Uh, by default, the data is treated as heteroscedastic, and unless you have a really good reason, a really good reason for uh, arguing that the data is homoscedastic, you should just go with the default and treat your data as heteroscedastic. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, try this out in R. Uh, let's see. So we're going back to the guinea pig data set uh, where we're comparing the differences in uh, growth of teeth, depending on whether the guinea pigs got orange juice or vitamin C. Presumably, these two data sets are independent of each other. And again, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there's um, a, that different dosages for the supplements were being applied, and we really should be taking account of that. But I'm not going to, because I'm here to uh, demonstrate how software works. So... Um, uh, so this data set is fine for those purposes. You could take Math3080 to see how we could possibly account for the supplement dosage. Okay, so uh, I get the two vectors, or OJ and VC, and then I do t-test OJ, VC, and that will get us the confidence interval. Uh, if we wanted to, we could check whether the data appears to be homoscedastic or not by creating a box plot, and the two groups don't appear to have radically different uh, spreads. So we might be able to get away with... Uh, homoscedasticity, but uh, the resulting interval barely changes. This is one of the reasons why uh, statisticians will not tell you to treat your data as if it's homoscedastic, because if your data is not homoscedastic, then the inter and you say that it is, then the interval will behave very badly. If it is homoscedastic, but you ignore that fact, then almost, then there's very little lost. So it's just there's just so much more advantage uh relative to um what's lost to always assume heteroscedasticity all right uh final example or final uh, topic is the difference in population proportions so 
we have uh, two populations of Bernoulli uh, data or data consisting of successes and failures. Um, the example I'm going to use here is uh, we have men and women who get melanoma and we want to compare the probability of death from melanoma. I think it's actually a five-year survival rate. Um, so we want to compare uh, those probabilities. So what we could do is examine the difference in the proportions uh, px minus py to decide which is bigger, which is smaller, whether they're the same, whether they're not, uh, and, and so on. Uh, this is more complicated to do. Uh, some of the functions that we've already seen, though, such as prop test, are pretty well suited uh, to uh, handling this 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 uh, this stuff. So binconf and binom test should not be used in this context, but prop test should. So all we need to do to use prop test to compare uh, population proportions uh, from two different samples is instead of passing in a single number for uh, the number of successes, you're going to pass in a vector uh, containing the number of successes in each group. And then you're going to pass in a vector of corresponding sample sizes. All right. So uh, let's demonstrate. The first thing I'm going to do is split the melanoma data set into uh, male and female parts. Uh, so we have fem uh, death, uh, whether the, that individual died within like five years of being diagnosed or something. And uh, man death. All right, so um, to get the uh, number of deaths for each group, we're going to sum up uh, these um, uh, these boolean vectors to get a deaths vector so 28 females died and 28 males died and then we look at uh, a size vector that is counting how many individuals uh, got melanoma so now like before it looks like uh, men and women were about the same and then we see the sizes and it's like oh my gosh there's far more women in the sample than men so uh, it's not looking good for the men and then we do prop test and uh, we, we we get a confidence interval for the difference in the uh, population proportions. Uh, zero is not in the interval, which is suggesting that the female likelihood or female probability of dying from melanoma is less than the male probability from dying from melanoma, um, which is also what the sample estimates are suggesting. And you would probably then say women are less likely to die from, from melanoma than, than men based off of this data. Okay, that's it for this lecture and uh, for what I had to say about confidence intervals. I will see you later uh, when talking about uh, statistical inference and uh, hypothesis testing. All right, so I'll see you then.